All right, so I'm just going to record this lecture. Uh, we are wrapping up chapter 35, Deuter Stomps, by capping it off with mammals. And then I'm talking a little bit about the origins of hominids. So I'm going to go through characteristics of mammals and compare the three groups of living mammals and then get into humans a little bit. So mammals, um, there's lots of different groups or classes of them, and mammals is just one of them. And there are different groups of mammals or different orders, and I will briefly um, talk about three big, big groups. But the characteristics of mammals is that they have body hair, uh, milk to feed their young, they take care of their young, they are warm-blooded or do endothermic um, or endothermy. So hair. There's about 5,000 species of mammals, fewer than fish, amphibians, reptiles, or birds. And of the 5,000, 4,000 are rodents, bats, shrews, or um, moles and they are probably distinguished from all other classes of vertebrates by two fundamental characteristics and that is hair and mammary glands um, but here are some other notable features where i'll go through some that are not listed um, so hair whales and dolphins they have sensitive bristles on their snouts that's where the hair is at uh, fur has the ability to help them regulate their body temperature so they can evade uh, colder climates maybe their fur is responsible for camouflage um, sensory structures, whiskers, maybe they're active at night and they use those whiskers to maneuver where they live underground, or even defensive weapons like porcupines and hedgehogs with their quills. A second characteristic of mammals is mammary glands, where the females secrete milk and that is the primary food source of the newborn. So yes, baby whales um, are nursed by their mother's milk. It's very high calorie food, 50% of it is fat, very uh, nutritious for the young. Endothermy. It means that they can be active at any time of the day and they can um, colonize or live in extreme environments. Um, it, you know, in order to be endothermy, you have to have efficient blood circulation and respiration provided by a diaphragm. Placenta. Females carry their young, their unborn young, in a uterus. And um, basically there's blood vessels that connect the young or the embryo to the mother and that is through the placenta. There's food, water, oxygen that passes from mom to the child, and then waste products um, are carried away by the circulatory system to mom. But you can see that we have some similar structures here with our um, am amniotic egg that we covered with reptiles. The amnion, um, the yolk sac, the uh, chorion. Okay, there's no allen, allen toys um, because it, get, it gets carried away by the blood vessels. In some certain groups, there's some other adaptations like specialized teeth to match what they're going to eat. And you can you know, pretty much get an idea of what an organism is consuming you know, if you come across a fossil just by examining the teeth. Digestion of plants, there's lots of herbivores that are mammals and they share a mutualistic relationship with bacteria to help them break down cellulose. A lot of, of those herbivores have four chambered fermentation vats um, that kind of are derived from their esophagus and stomach to help them utilize everything from uh, grass and the diets that they eat. So, yeah, so just showing different dentation found in some different species, um, showing the, re or sorry, the digestive system between herbivores, um, so non ruminant to ruminant to insectivore, which is smaller to your carnivore. A lot of mammals have hooves and horns, and it's made of keratin. So this is the basically the building material that you find in claws and fingernails and hooves. Um, so hooves, they're specialized pads. You find them in horses, cows, sheep, antelopes, and other running mammals, um, and horns. So yeah, it's composed of the core of, of bones surrounded by a sheath of keratin. So you can kind of see that right there. There are. Uh, flying mammals and basically it's bats. Bats are the only mammals capable of powered flight. So they have a leathery membrane of skin and muscles stretched over the bones of their forefingers. So some, those were some specialized characteristics of mammals. Um, modern mammals okay, are grouped into three groups here. Protothera, these are the most primitive. And the Protothera, the only surviving Prototherans today are your monotremes. Your egg lay in mammal. So I will go into the monotremes on the next slide. So the Protothera. The other major group is a subclass, um, Thera, and these are viviparous, which means that they, uh, the young are born live, okay? 
born alive or live, um, no egg, okay, just inside the placenta and all of a sudden out, um, where here they lay eggs and so they're still considered amniotes. Um, but two groups underneath the thera, the marsupials, which are your pouched mammals, and then the placentals. So the monotremes, okay, part of protothera. Um, the only surviving protothera are the platypi or the platypus and two species of the uh, echidina. I'm not sure if I'm, I'm butchering that. Yeah, probably okay. They do share some reptilian char characteristics, and that is why, um, you know, proto means before, thera kind of, I don't know what thera means, but proto means before. And so these are probably the precursor um, or the. They're more closely related to reptilians because they lay shelled eggs. Um, shoulder and pelvis are similar to some early reptiles, and they have a cloaca, a single opening where feces, urine, reproductive products come out. But they also have mammal characteristics, single bone on each side of the lower jaw, whereas with reptiles, I believe, it was multiple fur and mammary glands. Um, they do lack nipples, so milk oozes onto fur, and then the young just kind of lap it off. The only surviving protothera groups, like I said, are the platypi and the, yeah, I, whoa, sorry. I already read that slide. Okay, that's embarrassing. Here we go. Um, inside joke from a, for a former college biology student. Okay, marsupials, pouched animals. So the big difference with marsupials is their embryonic development. Um, so they have this egg, it's surrounded by the chorion and amniotic membranes, but there's no shell. Uh, the embryo, as nourished by yolk. After fertilization, it's born. It's tiny, it's hairless. If you've ever seen um, BB kangaroos when they're little, little, I mean, they're like literally like a couple of inches. They're so cute, um, but they're like hairless. So it's kind of scary at the same time. Crawls into the marsupial pouch, latches onto mammary gland uh, to continue development. Um, they evolved before placentals and most of them live in South America and Australia. So they have been exposed to long periods of geographic isolation. Placental groups are the final groups of mammals and they have a placenta, it's found um, inside the mother and that is where the embryo stays during its entire development in the uterus. And then when they're born, they go through more development or you know, reach, reach maturity, there's some parental care there, um, but the young stay in the embryo until they are ready to be born. Review questions, which of the following is not a characteristic, distinguishing characteristic of mammals? All of these are, so E. Select the groups of mammals that are not viviparous, which means they do not give uh, birth to live young. And that is A, the monotremes, okay? These do, these do, these do. That's the proto, monotremes are the protothera. All right, the final section is the evolution of primates. So I will, I'll go through some major characteristics there, um, talk about characteristics of some hominids, discuss some former um, species of hominids, and go through there. So, so primates, they, this is the group that gave rise to our own species, okay? And there are two distinct features that allowed them to succeed as these tree dwelling insectivores grasping fingers and toes so they can grip tree limbs, um, seize food, use tools, the first digit is that opposable thumb. And then binocular vision, where the eyes shift to the front of the head, and now we have overlapping vision that lets the brain judge distance precisely, you get that nice perception. So from the anthropoid lineage, uh, the earliest humans arose. So our living primates are today are divided into three groups, prosimians, anthropoids, and the hominids. Okay, so here are the prosimians in orange. Okay, eyes in front of face, grasping hand. Um, these guys right here are the anthropoids, larger brain, and then we get into the hominoids down here where we see a little bit more going on, especially bipedalism. So your prosimians is a paraphyletic group made of tarsiers, lemurs, and lorises. And so tarsiers, they're more closely related to monkeys and apes. Lemurs, you only find them in Madagascar through adaptive radiation, but these um, animals are small and nocturnal. So you can kind of see here my prosimians right there. Okay, so now I'm getting into the anthropoids. 
monkeys, apes, and humans are part of the anthropoids. Okay, so if I go back to this paraphyletic tree, all of this is anthropoids, and then we'll get into the hominoids. So they are diurnal. Um, they feed mainly on fruits and leaves. We have the changes in the eye design, um, and they live in groups that ha have very complex social interact uh, interactions. So a subgroup of the anthropoids is the new and old world monkeys. Okay, so the new world monkeys are those that migrated to South America about 30 million years ago. All live in trees, um, flat spread in noses, they grasp objects with their tails. Those that stayed in Africa gave rise to two lineages, old world monkeys and the hominoids, which includes apes and humans. So old world monkeys are ground dwelling, whereas up here they're all in the trees. No prehensile tails, so they can't grip objects with their tails. Nostrils are close together, the no noses point downward, and they do have some toughened pads of skin on their rumps. And then um, I'll go into apes and humans here. So make sure you know the difference between new world versus old world monkeys. All right, so hominoids includes apes and hominids. Um, so apes, examples of apes given, orangutan, gorilla, chimpanzees, hominids, humans. Uh, so apes have a larger, larger brains than monkeys, but they lack the tails. And we also see um, some adaptable behavior, except for maybe the humans. So when we compare apes with hominids, hominids are bipedal. We can walk upright, whereas apes walk on their knuckles. Another difference has to do with our vertebral column and how it's curved um, and the spinal cord exit at the bottom of the skull, whereas here it's at the back of the skull. Also, our human pelvis is broader and more bowl-shaped, and all of these features allow for bipedalism. Um, knuckle walking over here supports the weight on the dorsal sides of their fingers, um, and monkeys walk using the palms of their hands, whereas here they're using their knuckles. So now I'm gonna talk about some early hominids. So the major groups of hominids include, and, and I know it varies, three to seven species of the genus Homo, and then um, seven species of an older, smaller brain genus called Australopithecus. And this is all based on fossil evidence, but bipedalism really is the hallmark of hominid evolution. And the fossils that we have discovered um, can date it back to six to seven million years ago. Okay, so this is just showing um, a couple different things here. Brain size, okay, walking, teeth, and then uh, whether they lived in trees or not. Um, so you'll see that diets changed, um, bipedalism, notice the cranium size, right? Hom um, hominids, they are found within hom hominids, or sorry, yeah, that's what I wanted to say hominoids. Um, this is a monophyletic group comprising of Homo sapiens and at least 20 extinct bipedal relatives. So let's talk about some of the early Australopithecines. So all the fossils that we found in South and East Africa, um, they're about one meter tall and walked upright. Their dentation were kind of distinct for hominids, but their brains were pretty, you know, pretty small, 500 centimeters or less, whereas with homo sapien brains, it's over a thousand now. Bipedalism evolved with, when um, Australopithecine left dense forest for grasslands and open woodland. And so there's this chicken or egg debate between which occurred first, bipedalism or larger brains, but recent fossils do suggest that bipedalism first, and there's about a two million year difference between the two. No one exactly knows why bipedalism uh, came about. Tools didn't appear until 2.5 billion years ago. Um, walking is faster and it uses less energy versus walking on fours is a hypothesis. The, maybe the upright posture allowed us to see over grass and pick fruits from trees. Maybe the upright um, reduces body surface exposed to the sun's rays out in the open grasslands. Or maybe the, it, it freed their forelimbs so they could carry food back to the females. So we have this idea of pair bonding um, and finding mates. So those are some of the leading hypotheses or hypotheses uh, for bipedalism, but no one really can pin it down to one. The genus Homo arose about two million years ago. Its exact an ancestor is not clearly identified, but it might be the Australopithecus 
Afarensis. Um, the first human, Homo habilis, handyman, was found among some stone tools. Um, and then we have this idea that, or this hypothesis that humans or hominids evolved in Africa and kind of migrated out. So Homo erectus were much larger than your Homo habilis, and they walked upright, they had a larger skull, they had these prominent brow ridges, and maybe the shape of the skull suggested that speech was in place. Um, so Homo erectus species were very social. We found evidence of tribes or fossils, 20 to 50 people in caves. They hunted large animals, they cooked their meals, they used stone and bone tools, and they have survived for over a million years, and they've only disappeared about 500,000 uh, years ago. There, there have been some new additions to our hominid tree lineage, uh, Homo florescensis, which means um, the hobbit, because the fossils that we have found, they're one meter tall, and we found these fossils out in the um, oh, Pacific Islands. So the youngest fossils that we found of the Homo florescens is about 15,000 years old. Um, so yeah, modern humans first appeared in Africa about 600,000 years ago, and there's three species. Um, Homo hindelbergenus, Homo neanderthalinus, and then the Homo sapiens, which means wise men. So of the three, the Homo hindelbergenus is the oldest. Um, bony keel running along the midline of the skull, thick ridge over eyes, eye sockets, and a very large brain. Now, I just came across an article that talked about the Homo erectus line. Um, lineage and how maybe it persisted much longer than we previously thought almost basically to present day and if that's the case that means homo sapiens were not the only species of humans on the planet um so yeah uh homo florenses florenses no one knows why they're one meter tall um they think maybe it's a phenomenon of island dwarfism your book does touch on that i definitely would read up on it it's kind of a cool uh thing but it just shows or it just talks about how mammal species on islands tend to evolve um, or mammal species that evolve on islands tend to be much smaller um, than the mainland. So this graph right here shows time, millions of years back into presence, and here's our Homo sapiens. Here's the Homo forensians, Homo neanderthals, Homo hindebergs. These are the three recent homos, uh, Homo, <laughs> homo uh, genuses. And then we have our early Homo genuses. There's the handyman, and then the rectus, the one that um, evolved out of Africa. So this line right here ends where Homo sapiens start, but they think there might be some overlappage. And then your book does not mention these three, but it does mention Astropithecus and um, with the Afarnus. So here's the Homo hindenburginus, and you can see that it branches off into the Neanderthal and the Homo sapiens. Okay, you may have seen this term Cro-Magnons and Neanderthals. Um, these are both kind of subspecies, I, I guess, or sp other hominid re um, lines that existed. So here's the Neanderthal, but both made tools. They lived in huts or caves. They took care of those that got injured or sick. They buried their dead, and this is actually the first evidence of symbolic thinking because um, they made it ornamental in some cases. Uh, but for some reason, they disappeared about 34,000 years ago and were replaced by Homo sapiens um, called Cro-Magnons. -Mag there is this debate that maybe Cro-Magnons outcompeted Neanderthals or maybe the two species interbred merge in their gene pools. So this is just shown Homo sapiens versus the Neanderthal. We do see some distinct differences especially in the ribcage area and in the, in the pelvic bones um, and in size. This is recent news, the Den Denisovans. Um, so we came across a fossil that had Neanderthal and um, some modern humans and they didn't belong, they didn't know where those fossils belonged. Like they, they thought it was gonna be this group or this group. And when they tested it, um, it suggested that there was an unknown species of hominids called Denisovans, and this has led to a new field of study called paleogenomics. Um, and so your book discusses a little bit there uh, about Denisovans. So right here it says new member of the human family. Um, so let's just go back 
to Homo floresiens hobbits 10,000 years ago. Here's the Neanderthals, and they think this is where the branch is for the Denisol fins. Um, these are present day hominids, so maybe there is a branch here where maybe there was a third um, group. All right, so I'm going to finish it uh, with our own species, Homo sapiens. So I mentioned in a slide earlier the Cro Magnons and Neanderthals. The Cro Magnons will eventually become the Homo sapiens that we know, or that we are today. Um, so they came from Africa, they replaced the Neanderthals, and Homo sapiens are the only surviving species for the genus Homo. Um, our evolution has been marked by some pretty significant um, features, like an increase in brain size, how we are able to make and use tools, the ability for conceptual thought. This is a huge one, symbolic language um, with words shape concepts out of experience and then we pass that on toward the next generation and then i would say this is also a really really big one extensive cultural evolution which means just ways to change and mold our environment rather than change an evolutionary and response to the environment's demands because other organisms their environment changes and they don't adapt they go extinct but we are actually changing our environment um and changing the ways that we you know that we are so it's kind of like we control our biological future, which is exciting and frightening at the same time. This is a diagram that just shows um, how the origins of hominids out of Africa. Okay, so um, you'll find your oldest fossils in this region in Australia, and then your newest or youngest fossils just recently because they just, um, you know, travel. It took them longer to get to South America. All right. Select a statement that is not correct with respect to bipedalism. That is C, substantial brain expansion evolved 2 million years earlier than bipedalism. And then compare the length of time the modern human has been extant and the length of time dinosaurs were. And that would also be C. And there's no way you could have answered that from the notes because I didn't touch on that, but that's definitely in your book. Okay, select the correct definition of diurnal. That is C, active during the night. And then what distinguishes primates from mammals and other animals? That is D, grasping fingers, grasping toes, binocular vision. So D. Okay, so that does it for uh, the final two sections of chapter 35.